Only eight days ago, I concluded a broadcast on the World Trade Center bombing by telling you what senior U.S. law enforcement officials were telling us, that the threat of Muslim extremists operating within the United States is an ongoing danger, something we'll have to live with from now on. It's not uncommon for people to hold prejudices against foreign cultures that are oftentimes entirely unfounded. A lot of this has to do with our personal biases and the effect they can have on our understanding of others. Whether they be implicit or explicit, everyone has biases that stem from various aspects of one's identity, such as one's gender, religion, or ethnicity. These biases, while being inescapable, are not unidentifiable. When we do become conscious of our biases, it becomes clear the lengths they can go in fostering irrational hate towards different religions, societal norms, and ways of life. While the effect of this on an individual basis is malicious in its own right, what level of harm is caused when these same biases are co-opted into more powerful institutions, such as academia or the media? Edward Said's Orientalism in a way it works towards answering this question. Orientalism can simply be defined as the study or depiction of the Orient as done by the Occident, the Orient being defined vaguely as the East, and the Occident representing the West. While there isn't anything inherently wrong with Europeans studying the East, Edward Said points out that the discourse and artwork concerning the East being overwhelmingly controlled by the West comes with many problems. Whether it be subconscious or deliberate, the biases of these Orientalists often lead to very misleading or disingenuous products. Edward Said's book acknowledges this phenomenon as serving to propagate post-colonial narratives. The book Orientalism offers a post-structuralist critique that rejects the previous binary in which the Orient, specifically the Middle East, is viewed. The dichotomy between East and West is complete bullshit and only serves to reaffirm the notion that the Orient is incapable of self-definition. This is where stereotypes of the East as being this static, primordial relic of time comes from. Only defining the East in the context of the West allows Orientalists to make vague or abstract comparisons to propagate this idea. Dichotomies such as rational versus spiritual or modern versus traditional are often cited, further perpetuating the false dichotomy between East and West. To the Orientalist, this contrast justifies Western civilization as the foundation on which to build our future. This viewpoint inexplicably tries not to reconcile with the differences of various Eastern civilizations, but often resorts to vilifying or romanticizing such, which can be equally malicious. As such, Orientalism is inextricably linked to Western superiority. Orientalism has, of course, worked its way into several forms of media as well. Film and television often enjoy embellishing itself in this mystical, exotic caricature of the East. This often results in either subtle, perhaps unintended racism, or outright vitriolic racism. This can be anything from Arnold Schwarzenegger's True Lies, in which Arab men are portrayed as violent fanatics whose lives are expendable, to Wes Anderson's The Darjeeling Limited, where India and the people of it serve only as a catalyst for the character development of our white protagonists. In either case, the unwillingness to conscientiously portray these people is to a degree derived from their western biases. True Lies is nothing short of a propaganda film, in which Arab possession of weapons of mass destruction poses an existential threat to the US and justifies fulfilling their violent imperialist fantasies. The Darjeeling Limited, by contrast, may seem rather innocuous, yet remains malicious in its own right. The movie is just another in a long list of films that use the East as a self-help tool for white people. Wes Anderson, for all his veneer, is unable to write people of color, and so he simply doesn't. 
Ultimately, Orientalist film can be surmised by a few distinct qualities. This includes portraying incredibly complex, multifaceted civilizations as monolithic, unchanging backgrounds, giving characters of color virtually no depth of character, and finally the whitewashing of not only the protagonists, but the narratives associated with the film as well. This tradition invariably dehumanizes the people it tries to portray, relegating people of color to be mere aesthetic props in a white man's story. As this sort of film is condemned and Hollywood proceeds to create more diversity-oriented movies, it's important to remember that Orientalism isn't something of the past. In many ways, Orientalist movies are still being made, alongside the slew of older ones that maintain their cultural relevance. On top of that, it's important not to understate the malice that these sorts of films possess. Apart from racist depictions and denying people of color adequate writing, what I'd argue are even more pernicious are the narratives these films serve to propagate. To get an understanding of what I mean, observe Aladdin. Disney is very much guilty of portraying different cultures in a way that undoubtedly undermines their reality. And Aladdin is no different. The movie was Disney's attempt to capture the Middle East, specifically Iraq. The focal city, Agrabah, was initially meant to be Baghdad, until the Gulf War happened and they were forced to change it. To understand what makes this film Orientalist, one must look no further than the opening shot itself. The song Arabian Nights can be heard, explicitly calling their civilization barbaric, whilst panning onto a fantastical city in the middle of a desert. Any sort of historical accuracy has been completely abandoned from the get-go, in favor of creating this sort of caricature of a world. It's not that Disney is particularly known for their accuracy, but the narrative that's being shaped with these inaccurate depictions proved to be quite malicious. Rather than depict the region as the ecologically diverse place it is, they choose the setting of a static desert. The clothing bears no resemblance to what people would wear at the time and place, and especially doesn't make sense given the climate they've established. The usage of language in the film is particularly confounding to me. Names such as Aladdin are completely anglicized, whereas others such as Abu are not properly used. The characters throughout the film speak in English, however a few exceptions are made. For example, Allah is used instead of God, most likely to reaffirm to the audience that this is in fact an Islamic civilization. Yet they seem completely disinterested in conveying this fact through the architecture, societal makeup, or really any other lens. Alongside this are the many racist undertones that can be seen throughout the movie. Primarily with the protagonists or good guys speaking English in a native accent and being depicted as having normal features, as opposed to the villains who are seen speaking English in a rather nonsensical accent, as well as having extremely racialized features complete with disgustingly huge noses. This isn't the sort of thing you'd see in a Disney movie centered around Europeans. On top of this is the incredibly sexualized portrayal of Jasmine that we see in a lot of Orientalist works. Edward Said detailed the often gendered depiction of Arabs. Men are often perceived to be emasculated and weak, while women are portrayed as overly sexualized. Both of these hold true throughout Aladdin, where the men are depicted as emasculated and weak, while somehow at the same time being overly violent and repressive. Jasmine's lack of depth can simply be explained as Disney writing women. However, the way she is designed follows the persistent Orientalist trope that is the fetishization of Asian women. Western artists have historically depicted Middle Eastern women in a purely sexual way. In Orientalist paintings, women are often portrayed wearing little to no clothing, and in some cases, performing provocative acts. Rather innocuous aspects of Middle Eastern culture, such as ballet dancing, are also falsely sexualized. This artwork perpetuates the idea that Asian women are inherently sexual beings, whose value is derived from such. This Orientalist viewpoint doesn't allow for women to have aspirations or lives outside of the European male gaze ultimately confining them to be a sort of exotic commodity. In actuality, the role of women in Western Asian societies 
is far more complex than Orientalists are often willing to understand. The biased nature behind this sort of artwork contributes to the propagation of false narratives that seemingly prove the West is superior to the East. In this case, the over-sexualization of women is meant to portray Western Asia's repressive society and the objectified nature of the women in it. This is, of course, juxtaposed to the contemporary modest European woman. Interestingly enough, in recent times, this narrative has been completely flipped on its head, with the modest clothing of Muslim women now being construed as oppressive, while the Western trend of more revealing clothing is generally accepted to be liberating. This cognitive dissonance is exactly what is meant by the idea that Orientalism only serves to propagate post-colonial narratives. It's not that women shouldn't be able to wear what they want, or even that women in the Middle East don't face issues, but the way these issues are presented by Orientalists are at their core disingenuous. There is no real attempt to understand the intricate role of women in Western Asian societies, or how it is very much not monolithic. These arguments, in fact, have little to do with women at all, but rather how Western civilization can be construed as superior. These narratives, however, aren't confined to 19th century oil paintings, as the same flavor of narrative is seen in many Orientalist films, including Aladdin. All of the Orientalist tropes seen in Aladdin contribute to the othering of the people they're trying to depict. Rather than tell a story about a complex people in an intricate society, the writers make incredibly ignorant and frankly racist generalizations that covertly push the narrative of Western supremacy. Jafar, being the stereotypical authoritarian dictator over a supposedly barbaric and repressive society, establishes the need for a savior. Not just any savior though, the only one that doesn't speak in a made-up accent, or have extremely racist facial features. This narrative establishes the need for their whitewashed savior. This movie, being released just after the Gulf War, would have small but not insignificant implications with the successive Afghan and Iraqi invasions. While Aladdin is by no means solely responsible for US imperialism, it's not hard to see how the same narratives this film perpetuates are the same ones used when justifying such invasions. The white savior aspect of the film is strikingly similar to America's habit of spreading democracy and to see imperialism often rationalized in such a way is unfortunate. To see what effect this can have, here is a poll stating that 30% of Republican primary voters support bombing Agrabah. Yes, the fictional city. Ultimately, the propagandist nature of this film isn't as overt as something like True Lies, which makes it particularly harmful. A child watching Aladdin wouldn't see anything wrong with the film, and would probably enjoy it. For a movie targeted towards children, especially children who don't often get representation in media, this movie is an ultimate disservice. Orientalist film normalizes ignorance and can in many cases enable racist sentiment. This type of media often goes unquestioned, making it incredibly insidious. While Disney acknowledges the racist depictions in this film, the fact still stands that the film is a mere product of the American propaganda machine. Going forward, it's important for us to decolonize the stories and narratives coming out of Hollywood. It's time that Western filmmakers treat different civilizations and cultures with the same care and nuance that has long been afforded to the West, as well as for us to scrutinize and push back against any future problematic rhetoric. Thank you.